You're listening to The Jacob Balk Show. He's breaking down the latest and greatest in sports as only he can. Follow him on Twitter at Real Jacob Balk. Here he is, Jacob Ball. Hey, sports fans, welcome to another edition. Of the Jacob Volk Show. I am the Jacob Volk. Except no imitation. You know how people say I could do that when they're watching sports? Like, oh, I could kick that field goal. I can strike this guy out. I could score a goal against this goalie. I can make that shot or something like that. And it's all nonsense, right? Like, we all know that the people who say that are half drunk and they're not world-class athletes like the players that we watch every day are. I can honestly say that 99% of the people watching Monday Night Football yesterday could have done what the winning quarterback did. I mean, I can hand the ball off to seven different people. I could throw three passes. What's my biggest issue with Mac Jones? He's a game manager. He doesn't make anyone around him better. Yeah, that's what you saw yesterday. Now, look, it's not his fault, okay? I don't want to come off like I'm killing Mac Jones because by any objective metric, he is the best rookie quarterback this year. Of the four rookie quarterbacks that really had an extended chance to show what they could do. Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, Justin Fields, and Mac Jones. Jones will be the only one in the playoffs. Jones has great command of the offense. He's very smart. He's taken to the Patriots offense like... It's second nature. I've got to be fair. Mac Jones is the best rookie quarterback so far this year. Having said that, to only throw three passes in a game is tough. Now look, I understand why the Patriots did that. I'm not begrudging them or anything. It's just funny. It's funny that a starting quarterback in the NFL only attempted three passes in a game. But it worked. The Patriots won. I mean, make no mistake about it. You. Yes, you could have done what Mac Jones did yesterday. And you could call yourself a winning quarterback in the NFL. Only the Patriots could win a game where their quarterback completes only two of three passes for 19 yards. I mean, come on. Josh Allen did that on one drive. But you know what? Give the Patriots credit for this. They took what the elements were giving them. There's no way that any quarterback 
would have a good game throwing the football. I mean, those conditions were brutal. It was windy. It was freezing. It had to be miserable in upstate New York yesterday. I almost felt bad for the Patriots punter. Then I remembered that he's a Patriot. And it's impossible for me to feel bad for a Patriot. His punts are going sideways. Opening kickoffs are landing in the stands. I mean, inclement weather games are fun. There is a novelty to them that's very enjoyable. The thing is, though, there's a limit to it. Yeah, it was kind of funny to see the wind affecting the game as much as it did. But how enjoyable is it to watch a game where there were no touchdowns scored from the second to fourth quarters? How enjoyable is it to watch run after run after run after run? You know what the most fun thing was yesterday? I'll tell you. Figuring out which Patriot would run the football. Eight different Patriots had a carry yesterday. In a game where you're going to need to run the football to win, it can get very easy for the opposing defense. How can you combat that? By divvying up who carries the football. Damian Harris had 10 carries. Ramondre Stevenson had 24 carries. Brandon Bolden had 4 carries. The Patriots had some end-of-rounds going. There were power runs. There were outside runs. Josh McDaniels called a perfect game. Given the elements, he did all he could to enable the Patriots to win, and it worked. Like, yes, it's funny that Mac Jones only attempted three passes, but McDaniels had no choice. If he had Jones attempt 30 passes, the Patriots would have gotten shut out. I mean, look at the Bills. Josh Allen completed just 15 of 30 passes for 145 yards. Yes, he threw a touchdown. But let's examine how Allen scored that touchdown. It had nothing to do with him. It had to do with Nikhil Harry's inability to get out of the way of a punt. The ball grazed his face mask. The Bills recovered it. Then Allen threw a 14-yard touchdown strike to Gabriel Davis. Give him credit for making that throw, but it's not like he drove the Bills down the field or anything. Nikhil Harry just had a stupid brain cramp. And the other scoring drive, the field goal drive in the third quarter... That had nothing to do with Allen's arm. That had to do with his legs on the quarterback scramble to make it fourth and one. Then Miles Bryant gets called for unnecessary roughness. I did not think he should have been called for unnecessary roughness. I thought that was borderline. Allen is leaping. You know, he's trying to get that extra yardage. Of course Brian's going to push him. What do you want him to do in that spot? That was tough. I did not like that call. And Miles Bryant had a big moment later in that game. But I'll get into that later. The point is, because the Bills 
decided to let Josh Allen air it out and show everyone that they weren't scared of the elements. This is Buffalo weather. This is our hometown. We're going to rise above this and we're going to win. Their stubbornness cost them this football game. If they had run the ball more, if they had let Josh Allen have more than six carries, because he's a great athlete, if they had let Devin Singletary have more than ten carries, if they had made a concerted effort to get Zach Moss going, if they had made a concerted effort to get Matt Breda going, they would have won this football game. It was honestly a terrible job by Brian Dable. Someone who I like. Someone who I think could be a head coach when the next coaching carousel gets going. But I'll tell you what, if he calls more games like this, he's not even getting an interview. And Sean McDermott, too, needs to say something to him like, hey, we've got to run this football more. You want to tell me that the Patriots' defense was shutting down the Bills' running game? Well, not necessarily. The Bills ran the ball 25 times. They had 99 rushing yards. That's an average of just under 4 yards per carry. That's not bad. Think about it. If every run that you call results in a four-yard gain, you're always getting a first down. I mean, the Patriots' defense was great yesterday. There's no question about that. But the Bills' asinine play calling made them look a lot better. I mean, yes, it's funny to have your quarterback have a stat line where he completes just two of three passes for 19 yards, but at the end of the day, it got the Patriots the win. At the end of the day, I'd rather be laughed at for winning funny than get criticized for losing via an asinine game plan. Now, the end of this game was tough. The Patriots were up 14-10 to with about 13 minutes left to go in the game. The Bills drive down the field. They actually have first and goal at the Patriots' six. Then they just go backwards, no gain on the Zach Moss run, then Allen drops back to pass, he's sacked by Matt Judon, then he throws an incompletion, then Tyler Bass misses a field goal. I can't get on Bass for missing a field goal because of the elements in that game. But tell me why on second and goal, you're throwing a pass. Why are you trying to push the pass so much? Run the freaking football. Josh Allen was not having a ton of success throwing the football. Maybe you run a read option. Maybe you try a run to the outside with Singletary or Breda. You can't have Allen drop back and throw a pass. There are too many things that can go wrong by calling a pass at that point. You have the opportunity to put up points. You have the opportunity to take the lead. Instead, you just squander it with stupid play calling. Then the last drive of the game... It ended about as poorly as it possibly could have. The Bills have first and 10 at the Patriots 14. A run for one yard and an incomplete pass 
brings up third and nine. Dawson Knox gets called for a false start. So instead of third and nine, it's third and 14. Then he has a chance to redeem himself. And he drops it? I understand that Adrian Phillips was right on you. But you had a chance to catch that football. All right, you've got to box him out and find a way to secure that football. If you catch that pass, you give your team the lead. And I don't see Mac Jones being able to engineer a two-minute drill to win the football game when he had only thrown three passes the whole game. It's clear that no one had any faith in Mac Jones' ability to do anything in this game. So you have an opportunity to put the game away and you just drop the football? That doesn't work for me. Then 4th and 14, what a play by Miles Bryant. Watch the play from a bird's eye perspective. Taylor Kyles on Twitter, at tkyles39, has the perfect angle for the big Bryant play. Like, people got upset at Josh Allen for not finding Cole Beasley because Beasley was supposedly open. No, he wasn't. Bryant was on Beasley. Then when Bryant saw that Allen was going to throw a pass for Gabriel Davis, Bryant stays with the ball instead of taking himself out of the play. Now, we'll never know if Davis would have caught that ball or if it would have been dropped or batted away by the Patriots' corner because the ball never got to Davis. Bryant abandoned Beasley, played the ball, and batted the pass down. That is the correct decision there. A great job of changing directions, a great job of knowing the situation, just a fantastic play by Miles Bryant. You can't say enough good things about him. And of course he's another undrafted defensive back that the Patriots find. Malcolm Butler, J.C. Jackson, now Bryant? How do they do it? The freaking Patriots. A team that a year ago you thought was done. It's over. The dynasty is dead. The Patriots need to rebuild. They're uber aggressive in free agency. People criticize the signing of two tight ends. They draft Mac Jones, a quarterback who I really didn't like coming out of Alabama. I didn't think there was any chance that the Patriots would make the playoffs this year. Now, they're 9-4. They have the best record in the AFC. They're a game and a half up on the Bills. For the AFC East lead, they've won six straight. They've scored the second most points in the league behind only the Cowboys. They've given up the second fewest points in the league behind only the Bills. The Patriots are on bye next week. You know what the Bills have to do? They have to go to Tampa Bay to beat the Buccaneers at Raymond James Stadium. I mean, talk about the game of the week. I'm actually going to that game. I'm not kidding. I told you I was going to be in Florida next week. I'm flying out on Saturday. 
I'm going to be at Bill's Buccaneers on Sunday. Really looking forward to it. And let me tell you, I'll be pulling for the Buccaneers hard. I never thought I would root for Tom Brady. But you know what? I'll say it. Go Tom Brady. The Bills are a division rival. I have nothing against the Buccaneers. I'll root for the home team. I'm actually really excited about it. I haven't been to too many other NFL stadiums. Like, obviously, I saw the Jets at the Meadowlands. Obviously, I've seen them at MetLife a ton. Outside of that, I think the only other stadium I've been to is the Cleveland Stadium. I saw a Browns preseason game with replacement refs. Talk about lousy football. Now on this trip, I'll be going to two stadiums. Raymond James to see Bill's Buccaneers and Hard Rock Stadium to see Jets Dolphins. The first time I've ever seen the Jets on the road. I'm actually really excited about it. And there is one more thing that I want to say about this game. At the post-game press conference, Jordan Poyer and Micah Hyde got heated. They were asked a question by Jerry Sullivan of WIVB and the Niagara Gazette. Here was the question. It's been over 40 years since a team has won a game passing that few times in a game. Is that embarrassing? Poyer and Hyde really didn't like it. Sullivan doubled down on it by saying the nation's going to be criticizing you. Poyer and Hyde really didn't like that. Here's the thing. Sullivan was right that it's been over 40 years since a team has won a game like that. In fact, to be specific, it's been 47 years. Sullivan's question isn't bad. It's just not phrased the right way. There are three fundamental qualities that a question should have when you're conducting an interview with a player, with a coach, with an executive, with someone like that. It should be open, it should be neutral, and it should be lean. You also shouldn't have any double-barreled questions. What do I mean by that? An open question is one that you can't answer via yes or no. So starting a question with is or do or can or something like that, you're not supposed to do that because then you can just get shut down with a one-word answer. If you're going to do it, be prepared to ask a quick follow-up. Like, why do you say yes or why do you feel that way? Something like that. It can be done in certain aspects, like with people who really want to talk, you can lead them down that path, and they'll take the ball and run with it, but not players. They're usually more reserved. The question certainly wasn't neutral, because he's implying that Poyer, Hyde, and the entire Bill's defense was embarrassed by their performance. Now, should they be embarrassed? The answer is yes. If you're a Bills fan, you've got to be furious that your team gave up 222 rushing yards. That your team let Damian Harris go off. 
that your team let Ramondre Stevenson have some good moments. That your team let Brandon Bolden have some good moments. No one's going to mistake any of those guys for Sam Cunningham anytime soon. They should be embarrassed. You just can't ask them that. Because if they're not embarrassed, they're going to get upset at you for implying that they are embarrassed or they should be embarrassed. The question was lean. It wasn't the leanest question ever. Lean means getting straight to the point. Sullivan was trying to preface it by giving some historical context. The question itself was only three words. It's not bad. And double-barreled questions, he didn't do any of that. It's asking, like, two questions in one. It's something like, why did you trade for this guy, and how do you see him fitting on your team? That's a double-barreled question. Because what happens is one question usually gets lost in the shuffle. You shouldn't ask double-barreled questions, period. And look, depending on the context, I guess you don't need to be neutral. Like, if you're doing a sports talk show and you have Jordan Poyer on, you can ask him if he feels embarrassed. Because the goal there is to have a conversation. The goal there is to enlighten the audience. In a post-game press conference... The goal is to get catchy sound bites that you can put in your article or your sports cast or something like that. See, there's another thing to interviewing. When you interview someone, you need to have a path and a goal. A goal is what you hope to accomplish by conducting the interview. A path is how you're going to get there. Think about it like a GPS. If you want to get to Yankee Stadium, you punch in Yankee Stadium in the GPS. Your goal is to get to the stadium. How are you going to get there? What roads are you going to take? That's the path. It's the cross island to the Throg's Neck to... The Bruckner, to the Cross Bronx, to the Deegan. Let me tell you, I can get to the stadium with my eyes closed. I know the back roads to the back roads to the back roads to the back roads to the back roads. There's no way of getting to the stadium that I haven't done. But the point is, Sullivan really didn't follow... Two of the necessary qualities for a question. It wasn't open, which isn't the end of the world, but it wasn't neutral. And that's when things can get tense. Here's how the question should have been asked. How do you feel about giving up 222 rushing yards tonight. That's it. That's a question based in fact. So it's neutral, it's lean, it's only one sentence, and it's open because Poyer and High need to go in depth to answer it. What Sullivan was trying to do wasn't wrong. He wanted to get to Yankee Stadium. He had the right goal in mind to figure out how Poyer and Hyde felt about getting torched by the Patriots running game and losing a game where the opposing quarterback only attempted three passes. The thing is, though, his path was wrong. Instead of taking a direct route to the stadium, he went to Montauk 
and then had to double back. Then he went into Manhattan. Then he took the Lincoln Tunnel to Jersey. Then he spun around and got to the stadium. Again, I don't begrudge Sullivan for what he was trying to do. But the way that he did it was wrong. That's the thing. That's why he got an apoplectic answer by Poyer and Hyde. I mean, I don't blame Poyer and Hyde for getting upset. If you're asked a question like that, yeah, you're going to be on the defensive. Sullivan should have dealt with it better. That's a bad job by him. All right, now I'll give you some NBA vault talk. And this story broke before I started recording yesterday. The thing is, though, I just missed it. I was in my own world with what I wanted to talk about. That I didn't check Twitter to see if anything new happened like I usually do. I should have. I didn't. I'm sorry. I found out about this story via a King of the Fourth Quarter video. Shout out, Kenny. So I figured I'll talk about it now. It's not the end of the world to talk about it now. I should have talked about it yesterday, but I'll talk about it now. It's fine. According to Shams Charania and Sam Amick of The Athletic, Damian Lillard is getting ticked off. He is not getting along with Chauncey Billups. And Lillard wants the team to pull off a major roster shakeup, namely trading for Ben Simmons. When Neil Olshee was in charge of the Blazers, Charania and Amick said that he proposed a trade of C.J. McCollum, a first-rounder, and either Nasir Little or Anthony Simons for Simmons. Daryl Morey countered with McCollum and multiple draft picks and pick swaps. The Blazers said no to that. At this point, if you're the Blazers, you have to make a very tough decision. Okay, you've reached the point of no return. Let's make this clear. Neil Olshey wasn't fired because of basketball-related reasons. He was fired because he was a bully. And his conduct was unacceptable... So the Blazers made a change. Damian Lillard wanted Jason Kidd to be the Blazers' next head coach. Instead, he got Chauncey Billups, a first-time head coach, who has publicly criticized the team for subpar efforts. You have a choice to make. If you're the Blazers... You can either placate Damian Lillard by trading for Ben Simmons or blow things up. Say, you know what, we're not going to be told by our players who we should and shouldn't trade for before this situation becomes really toxic. We're going to trade Lillard now. I'm leaning towards the latter, and I'm going to tell you why. The Trailblazers trading for Ben Simmons makes them better. There's no question that he'd go a long way towards improving a Trailblazers defense that is basically like Swiss cheese. But he's not going to turn the Blazers into a title contender. They'd make the playoffs with Simmons. But they wouldn't make the Western Conference Finals. Lillard would still be upset. And you'd be at a point where you'd either need to make 
another blockbuster move to keep Lillard happy, or Lillard wants out anyway, despite you trading for Ben Simmons. It's done. The die has been cast. Neil Olshey had faith in the roster that he constructed. That's why he didn't drastically overhaul it. Well, he was wrong to have that faith. Because the Blazers now have lost three straight. They are the 10 seed in the West. They'd have to go through the Timberwolves in a play-in game to have the opportunity to sneak into the 8th seed. They're 1-10 in 10 on the road. They're not a good team. Flat out, they're just not. If the goal for Lillard was to make the playoffs, yes, trade for Simmons. But that's not why Lillard's upset. Lillard's upset Because he wants to win. And he's not getting any younger. He's 31. He's made the playoffs. He's made the playoffs every year of his career except his rookie season. He wants to win a title. I don't blame him for that. You want to begrudge him for wanting out, for being a nuisance, fine. But at the end of the day, I think he's right to be upset. I think he's right to be upset that he's been in the playoffs eight times and has only gotten out of the first round three times. It's not his fault. It's just that the Blazers keep putting out bad rosters around him. You look at the Blazers roster, it's a solid roster. They've got some good players. Obviously, Lillard is great. C.J. McCollum's very good. Norman Powell's very good. Yusuf Nurkic is very good. And Anthony Simons and Nasir Little are really good young players. But it's not a championship roster. Defense wins championships. The Blazers' defense is putrid. Let's say they get into the playoffs. They're not making any noise. Even if they trade for Simmons, they're not making any noise. It's done. The die has been cast. You need to move on from Damian Lillard. There's no salvaging this. Trade him now before the situation becomes toxic. I don't know where you'd trade him to. If the Blazers and Sixers can't agree on a Ben Simmons trade, that takes the Sixers out of the running. The Knicks have been mentioned as a possible suitor for Lillard. The thing is, though, who do the Knicks have that would make you want to trade Damian Lillard? R.J. Barrett? Barrett can't be the centerpiece of a Lillard trade. I mean, you give me Barrett, quickly, Toppin, Robinson, and Picks... I'll consider it, but that's a lot to give up for one player if you're the Knicks. They would do it because they really need a starting point guard. Alec Burks isn't that guy. Kemba Walker's out of the rotation. But boy, oh boy, that would gut their bench. It would be the mellow trade all over again. Yes, you're getting a superstar, but... You wouldn't have a championship roster around him. I mean, selfishly, I thought about the Nets. Lillard for Kyrie works, according to the NBA trade machine. I don't know if the Blazers would do it. They probably wouldn't. I'll say this, though. 
if they're open to trading C.J. McCollum, I would do Kyrie for McCollum straight up. Kyrie Irving is better than C.J. McCollum, okay? I don't want to give up too much more than just Kyrie. And I think Irving would be able to play right away for the Trailblazers. I don't think there's a mandate that would bar him from playing at the Moda Center. Now, you want to tell me that's selling low on Kyrie? Maybe it is, but at the end of the day... If Kyrie really isn't going to play this year, I'd rather his roster spot go to someone who can help the team right now. I mean, C.J. McCollum fits the Nets perfectly. They need shooting. What can C.J. McCollum do? Shoot. This guy shot 37.5% from beyond the arc every year of his career. He's put up over 20 points per game in his last seven seasons. And he's used to playing with a star in Lillard. If the Blazers are going to blow things up, why would they stop at just trading Lillard? i trade McCollum too. And I do think the Nets can sneak in. Get Kyrie Irving, a guy who can be a free agent at the end of the year. So his big salary wouldn't be on the books for much longer. I don't think Irving is going to opt into his contract. I don't see him doing that. I think he'd want to become a free agent. So the Blazers could let him walk. And now they have cap room to take on bad contracts and get young players and picks. I think McCollum for Kyrie makes sense. Kyrie is a better player than McCollum. But, again, if he's not going to play this year, and God only knows if he will or if he won't, I'll take C.J. McCollum. Think about this starting lineup when everyone comes back. Harden, McCollum, Harris, Durant, and Aldridge. That team's winning an NBA title, easily. Now, the Blazers aren't the only team that could be shaking things up soon. According to Shams Charania and Bob Kravitz of The Athletic, the Pacers are going to be very active prior to the deadline. They mentioned guys like Karis LeVert, Domanis Sabonis, and Miles Turner as potential trade candidates. The Trailblazers, for a while, have tried to retool their roster in the hopes that that would get them over the hump. I mean, this year they hired Rick Carlisle as their head coach, brought him back to the Pacers. And there was a sense of optimism with the team, but the Pacers right now are dreadful. In the Eastern Conference, there are really 12 teams that are at least decent. And there are three teams that are really bad. The Pacers are one of those three teams that are really bad. It's the Pacers, Magic, and Pistons. Their offense is just really bad. Their bench is useless. At the end of the day, if you're the Pacers, what would you rather be? A team that maybe just maybe sneaks into the playoffs? If TJ Warren comes back, and plays amazing? Or would you rather gear up for the future? Realize that this core that you have isn't going to put it all together. So let's build for the future. I'd rather build for the future. I don't see the Pacers making 
a lot of noise. The thing is, though, the Pacers, if they trade Lavert, Sabonis, and Turner, won't really be in rebuild mode. They'll still have Malcolm Brogdon. They'll still have Warren. It'll be kind of weird. Like the Pacers will look to trade those guys at the draft. And they'll be motivated to do it. I just don't know what they'd get for him. I mean, Brogdon is not shooting the ball well. He's shooting 31% from beyond the arc. Warren hasn't played at all this year, and he only played in four games last year. The Pacers' future right now is very murky. Should they trade Lavert, Sabonis, and Turner? The answer is yes. But they better hit on those trades. Like, don't just give them away. You've got to get picks and or players that can really help you in the future. I just don't know what exactly you're going to get for these guys. Like I said, the Pacers' future is very cloudy. Moving on now to the Heisman Trophy finalists. They were announced yesterday... They feature three quarterbacks and a defensive end. The defensive end is Aiden Hutchinson, obviously of Michigan. And the three quarterbacks are Pittsburgh's Kenny Pickett, OSU's C.J. Stroud, and Alabama's Bryce Young. We can argue from now until the cows come home whether other players should have been finalists. Maybe a guy like Kenneth Walker III. Maybe a guy like Will Anderson Jr. The thing is, though, who are you taking out? You can only have four finalists. I really didn't have a problem with these four. I think we can all agree that they deserve to be In the discussion, at the very least, whether they were the most deserving, I mean, that's a perspective thing. I'll tell you, I don't mind these four guys being the finalists. Now, for my money, this is really between only two guys. C.J. Stroud and Bryce Young. While Kenny Pickett had a great year and is certainly in the conversation for being the first quarterback taken in this coming draft, he's not at the same level as a guy like Stroud or Young. And Hutchinson, the only way a defensive player is going to win the Heisman is if he has a transcendent year like Charles Woodson did for the Wolverines many moons ago. Hutchinson didn't have that. He had a great year. He's going to be a great player in the pros. But he didn't have a Heisman Trophy winning season. So it's really between Stroud and Young. And ultimately, I've got to go with Young. By any objective metric, Young had a better season. He had more passing yards. He had more touchdowns. He threw one fewer interception. Even though neither quarterback is really a running quarterback, Young was better running it. And the Crimson Tide were obviously better than the Buckeyes this year. Also, there is something to be said about OSU failing to beat their arch rival. Say what you want about how Alabama won, but at the end of the day, they still won. That means something. Young came alive when he needed to and led the Crimson Tide to victory. Then he torched Georgia 
in the SEC title game. The Heisman Trophy has to go to Bryce Young. He's the only logical choice. I don't really think it's that close to tell you the truth. Bryce Young should win the Heisman Trophy. All right, now I'll give you some NHL Volk talk. Again, this is another story that broke yesterday, but I just missed it. Bad job by me. It's the Flyers firing Elan Vigneault. They also got rid of Michelle Terrian and named Mike Yao their interim head coach. Chuck Fletcher, the Flyers' GM, is obviously familiar with Yao. They were together with the Wild once upon a time. Now, I like Alain Vigneault. I think he's a very good coach. But it's clear as day that what he was doing with the Flyers just wasn't working. I mean, I thought he did a great job with the Rangers, but he couldn't carry that over to Philly. They got upset by the Islanders in the bubble. They didn't make the playoffs last year. This year, they're 8-11-4. They're on a nine-game losing streak. If not for the Islanders, they'd be in last place in the Metropolitan Division. Vigneault's a good coach, but yes, the Flyers had to change things up. Now, it'll be interesting to see if Yao does enough to get the job on a permanent basis. I'll tell you, I don't think Yao's a great coach. I don't think he's awful. But I don't think he's great. I'll give you a couple guys who I think would be better. Rick Tockett and John Tortorella. Given the talent, or lack thereof, that Tockett had to work with, with the Coyotes, he did not do a terrible job. Like, yes, his first year there was rough. But his second year... They were technically over 500. The year after that, they made the playoffs. They won the qualifying round against the Predators in the bubble. Then the year after that, they were only two games under 500. Then he got canned because the Coyotes were going with a youth movement. And they wanted a coach that was better with younger players. Enter Andre Torini, who is doing a terrible job with the Coyotes. Not his fault, they have no talent, but the simple fact is, they're 5-18-2. They're a dreadful team. Tockett was a really, really good flyer once upon a time. Spent 11 years there, put up 508 points in 621 games, was just inducted into their Hall of Fame. I think he'd get the fans excited. He's the guy who was mentioned as the likely permanent head coach from the jump. But I'll give you another guy who I think would be an excellent fit. John Tortorella. John Tortorella succeeds in big markets. Look at what he did with the Rangers. He made the Eastern Conference Finals with them. He loves dealing with the vicious media, and he loves giving it right back. Tortorella would be a perfect fit. For the Flyers, just from an identity standpoint. Like, Philly fans are nasty. Tortorella's a nasty dude. I really think that could work. I really think the city would grow to embrace Tortorella. I think they'd see a lot of themselves in him. 
Now, granted, he did not have a good end to his time with the Blue Jackets, and he's on the older side. He's 63. But I think Tockett and Tortorella would make a ton of sense for the Flyers. There was a death in the sports world that I missed, sadly. That is the passing of Bill Glass, who died on Sunday at the age of 86. You think about the best defensive ends of the mid-60s. You think of guys like Willie Davis, Henry Jordan, Deacon Jones, Bob Lilly, Merlin Olsen, guys like that. Bill Glass is in that mix. Bill Glass was a great Cleveland Brown. The thing is, though, his career got off to a really rocky start. After dominating at Baylor, he spent three years with the Bears, was an All-American his last year there, 1956, and was inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame in 1985, Glass was drafted 12th overall by the Lions in the 57 draft. But he didn't sign with the Lions. He went to the CFL. He played a year with the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. Then he went to the Lions and really didn't do much. Like, it looked like he was going to flame out of the NFL and just be a footnote in history. But Paul Brown took a chance on him. And in 1962, he was traded along with Jim Ninowski and Howard Hopalong Cassidy for Milt Plum, Tom Watkins, and Dave Lloyd. Glass dominated with the Browns. His first year there, he made the Pro Bowl. He's been retroactively credited with 15 and a half sacks. The year after that, he made his second straight Pro Bowl. Had nine and a half sacks. The year after that, he made his third straight Pro Bowl. He had eight and a half sacks. The 64 Browns made the NFL title game and shut out the Colts 27 to nothing. Glass had a sack and a half in that game. Pop quiz. Who had the other half a sack? Jim Kanicki. It is okay if you don't know who that is. The year after that, Glass had 16 and a half sacks, didn't make the Pro Bowl because no one kept track of sacks back then. The Browns made it back to the NFL title game, but they lost to the Packers 23 to 12. The year after that, he had 15 sacks. The year after that, he made his last Pro Bowl. He had ten and a half sacks. To this day, he holds the record for most sacks in Brown's history. If you count the retroactively credited sacks, which I do. If people went back and did the work, why wouldn't I count it? I trust these guys. I trust Pro Football Reference. Glass was named to the Cleveland Browns Legends Program in 2007. You can certainly make the argument that his number 80 should be retired. You can make the argument for him to be in the Hall of Fame. He had a great six-year peak. 
I wouldn't be opposed to putting Glass in the Hall of Fame. I think it's an interesting debate. I can make the argument for it. I can make the argument against it. But at the very least, he's borderline. And make no mistake about it, he had a career that anyone would be proud of. May he rest in peace. Until tomorrow, I'm Jacob Volk, and always remember, if you disagree with me, you're wrong.